God wants us to prosper. It is God's will that we prosper. Prosper materially. Prosper financially. We need to know that. We need to see that. We need to see it clearly. Clearly from the word of God. And um, I like to read a uh, number of uh, scriptures and we'll take them as our text. And they'll be my golden texts actually for these meetings. The first of them in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we'll read verse 18. We're going to read a, uh, about three different portions of scripture. We'll take as our texts. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and in verse 18, the Bible says there, it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, 
For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Then let's turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 66, Psalm 66, Psalm 66, and we'll read verse 12. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. Thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. Well, um, this is a, a, a Thomas Nelson, King James Version, where it says wealthy place. The margin says a moist place. The New American Standard Bible says a place of abundance. And lastly, Psalm 102. Psalm 102. Psalm 102. From verse 1 to 3. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord and delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house and his righteousness endureth forever. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you're our Father and you're a good Father. Thank you once again for another opportunity today for us to mingle our voices together in prayer, in praise, in adoration for your loving kindnesses and your tender mercies that are forever ours. Thank you most of all for the great plan of redemption which you planned and sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to consummate. Thank you for your word that brings us a revelation of that plan. We approach your word humbly and reverently. We trust that by your spirit you will unveil, unfold, and reveal the word of God unto our spirits. Thank you because the greater one will live big in me tonight. He'll rise big in me. He'll think through my mind. He'll speak through my lips. He'll act through my deeds. He'll anoint me to stand and minister in the office of my call. I will give all praise and honor and adoration for everything that will be wrought in our midst. To that worthy and majestic name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, talking about moving in the flow. And um, the thing is this. Like we read in those portions of scripture, it's clear that God gives us power to get wealth. That's his plan. That's his will. And um, he has a wealthy place for us in Christ. He has a place of provision. He has a place of abundance that he wants us to walk in. In talking about the man that first Lord, the Bible says that wealth and riches are in his house. And his righteousness abided forever. So it's not just any kind of wealth. It's talking about a righteous wealth. Amen. So God wants us to walk in that flow of his provision. He wants us to walk in the flow of his supply. In the flow of his abundance. That's his plan. That's his will. And the thing about it is this. If we will come in line with his word. And act upon his word. It will work. God's word has integrity. And it can be trusted. We know that he's not a man that he should lie. Nor the son of man that he should repent. Numbers 23, 19. As he said and shall he not do it. As he spoken and shall he not make it good. So his word has life. His word has power. His word has the ability to bring to pass exactly what it promises and what it provides. So what I'll endeavor to do, just to look at certain things from God's word, certain um, important things. When it comes to walking in this flow of wealth, walking in the flow of provision that God intends, living in abundance the way God wants, there are certain things in his word that if we get a hold of them and walk in the light of those things, they will work. Now, one thing about it is, I don't believe I'm really saying anything, going to say anything new. This is a word church. 
I'm just simply going to stir up our pure minds by way of remembrance about these truths from God's word. Well, the very first thing I'd like to say is this. Number one. Now, seven of them, seven important things about biblical prosperity. That Those are the things I've been looking at and talking about walking in, moving in the flow. Seven important things about biblical prosperity. Uh, and I'm not going to take all seven tonight. I'm going to just take them through the meetings. So I'll start with the first, uh, maybe two or three this evening. Number one, it is God's will that we prosper materially and financially. It is God's will that we prosper materially and financially. We know that faith begins where the will of God is known. We know that. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the measure of our faith is the measure of our knowledge of our father and of our rights and privileges in his family. We know from James 1, 5 to 8, the Bible says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives liberally to all men and upbraids not. It says, well, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. As long as we vacillate on that issue, whether or not it's God's will for us to prosper, we won't be able to prosper the way God wants. The issue of biblical prosperity in recent years has been attacked. There are folks who are coming and saying, well, there isn't pros uh, prosperity in redemption. Redemption has nothing to do with prosperity. We're hearing some people say that. We're hearing a lot of stuff about those things. And then some believers are saying, you hear them say, oh, those health and wealth folks, they've come again. Those prosperity preachers, they've come again. You know, I told somebody, I said, listen up. I don't know what you are, but I'm not a poverty preacher. I'm a Bible preacher. And Joshua 1 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. It says, For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So God's word produces prosperity. In Psalm 1 1 3, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So there's prosperity in God's word. God's word guarantees prosperity. So if you're talking about prosperity preachers, I plead guilty. Guilty as charged. I'm not a poverty preacher. Yes, I know uh, we can take anything to an extreme. We can make it look like gain is godliness. And that's not true. We can make it look like it's money at all costs. But that's not what we stand for. We, you know, we can merchandise the anointing. We can fleece God's flock. We've seen those things. And um, yeah, anybody who loves the Lord doesn't want to be classed with that. But the tendency is this. If we're not careful, we'll now draw back from prosperity. We now pull back from prosperity. But you see, we don't throw the baby away with the dirty bath water. Because some people went on one tangent on prosperity and became covetous, became materialistic. It doesn't do away with the truth of God's word about the fact that God wants us to prosper. Then I'll also say this, in our circles, what of faith circles, well, I'm from uh, Rhema, uh, we tended to be careful about some of these things, you know, because of some excesses. But you see, the problem is this, we now got so careful until we became apologetic about prosperity. And I don't believe that's right. God wants us to prosper. It is God's will that we prosper. Prosper materially. Prosper financially. We need to know that. We need to see that. We need to see it clearly. Clearly from the word of God. There's no way we can exercise intelligent faith for prosperity if we're not sure what God's will is about it. If we're wondering, well, this thing, eh, should I be a part of it? Is this really true? Should I get in, into it? As long as we are vacillating, we won't prosper the way God wants us to prosper. But let's settle it once and for all. It is God's will that we prosper materially and financially. Now, I wouldn't make a statement like that if I couldn't prove it. You say, why is it God's will for us to prosper materially and financially? Well, I'm still on my first point. And I'll give a number of reasons why I can say that. First, because it's in the redemptive plan. It's in the redemptive plan. 
in Galatians 3, 13 and 14, the Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Says that the blessing of Abraham I come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Thou might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. So it says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. From the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? There's no other way to find out than to go to the law and find out what its curse is. We find that the curse of the law was threefold. First part of it is spiritual death. God told Adam in the garden, the day you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, in that day you'll die. Genesis 2, 17. Well, Adam did the unthinkable, committed high treason. We know that. And we're redeemed from spiritual death. But we also know that sickness and disease is a part of that curse. Deuteronomy 28, 61. Also, every sickness and every plague that's not uh, in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring. Actually, the literal Hebrews, them will the Lord permit to be brought upon thee until thou be destroyed. So sickness and disease is also a part of that curse. But also included in that curse of the law is poverty. Poverty is a curse. Poverty is a curse. It's not a blessing. It's a curse. In Deuteronomy 28, you know, sometimes you do people an injustice just quoting some of these things. It's good to see them in our own Bibles. Amen. Praise God. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I'm going to read from verse 15. The Bible says there, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I commanded this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. Now, if that is in poverty, then I don't know, I, I don't know the English language. Well, if you go again, the same chapter, uh, verse 38 through to 40, it says, Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and thou shalt... Gather but little in, for the locusts shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. Now that's poverty. That's poverty. Walking like an elephant and eating like an ant. That's poverty. And it's clear that it's part of the consequence for breaking God's law. Now the truth is this, that in Adam we all violated God's law. Romans 5.12 says, So by one man sin came into the world and death by sin. It says, And so death passed upon all men in that all have sinned. So the consequence of breaking God's law were men to come on all of us. Now some people have said that was just to the Jews. But the book of Galatians is an epistle written to the Galatian church, which was a Gentile church. And he said, Christ has redeemed us. If I say us, I'm talking about me and the people I'm talking to. Christ has redeemed us. That's what Paul said from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, which is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Then he said that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Thou might receive the promise of the spiritual faith. So the blessing of Abraham is ours. It's ours. What was the blessing of Abraham? Of course, it was primarily a spiritual blessing. Then there was a physical blessing there as well. Then there was also material provision that's part of that blessing. Any blessing that the children of Israel had was because of their father Israel. Any blessing that Israel had was because of his father Isaac. Any blessing that Isaac had was because of his father Abraham. So all those promises and provisions God gave to the Israelites as we read them in the Old Testament, they are part of the blessing of Abraham. And they belong to us in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.29, the Bible says, And if he be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So we are Christ's, and as such, we are Abraham's seed. We are heirs according to the promise. So we're redeemed from the curse. We're redeemed from poverty. And prosperity is God's will for us. Well, 2 Corinthians 8.9, the Bible says, So we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. That we through his poverty might become rich. When was Jesus poor? Was he poor in his earth walk? No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Now, the, the man had uh, 12 disciples. They left all the work they were doing. And um, they didn't lack. They had families. We know Peter had a mother-in-law. So he must have been married. 
James and John had their father Zebedee. And their mother too. The Bible speaks of their mother. And the Bible says he that doesn't provide for his own, especially those of his house. He has denied the faith. He's worse than an infidel. So they must have provided for their families. Jesus said, when I sent you out and I told you not to take anything, did you lack anything? Jesus had so much money, so much resources available to him, he needed a treasurer. I don't know how many people have a personal treasurer. He needed a treasurer in the ministry. And the treasurer happened to have been a thief who was making uh, his way with the money. But there was still more than enough for all their needs to be met. Amen. So listen, in his earth walk, he wasn't poor. Jesus, you know, they fought over his clothes. Roman soldiers. It's like when they used to... Uh, uh, Kill people by firing squad at Bar Beach in Lagos back then. You know, criminals. And let's say American soldiers were the ones there. And the American soldiers were fighting over the clothes of one of those criminals who was about to be shot dead. That's the picture. Those clothes weren't cheap. They were seamless. So Jesus in his earth walk, yes, he wasn't ostentatious, but he wasn't a poor man. He wasn't a poor man. He was by no means a poor man. You know, when Jesus uh, was talking to them, about the poor. He said the poor. You know, one lady took a whole year's salary worth of perfume and uh, applied it on him. And some folks got angry. Judas, of course, you trust him. Not because he cared about people, but because he had the bag. And um, he said this should have been sold and given to the poor. Then Jesus said the poor you have always with you. He said, but me you don't have with you. So he wasn't among the poor. He wasn't among the poor. Jesus was not by any means a poor man. Yeah, people talk about foxes have holes, birds of the hair have nests, son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Yes, I know. But he wasn't a vagabond. At that time that Luke talks about, he was on his way to Jerusalem. That was just before his crucifixion. And um, he was itinerating at that time. He had a home in Capernaum. Amen, that's clear. So when was Jesus poor? Jesus wasn't poor in his earth walk. He was poor on the cross. That's when he became our substitute. That's when our sicknesses and our diseases were laid on him. That's when our curse was laid on him. That's when our poverty was laid on him. He became poor for us on that cross so that we might be rich. Now, does rich mean we're all going to be millionaires? No. But rich means abundant provision. Rich means a full supply. If it will take you being a millionaire for you to have a burden provision, then believe for it. If it will take you being a billionaire, amen. You know, what God promised us, we can have our needs met, we can have our wants supplied, and we can have abundance for every good work. That's his plan. That's his will. That's his mind. And it's part and parcel of the finished work of redemption. Isaiah 53 from verse 1. The Bible says, who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form, no comeliness. When we should see him, there's no beauty. We should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. That word literally is sicknesses or diseases. Carried our sorrows. Literal Hebrews, pains. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5, which is where I was going. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. The punishment that brought us shalom was upon him. That word shalom means nothing missing, nothing broken. Amen. That word shalom includes prosperity, includes our welfare. So the punishment that brought us supply was laid on him. Amen. So it's in the redemptive plan. It's in the redemptive plan. It's God's plan. It's God's will that we prosper. First, because it is in his redemptive plan. There is a wealthy place for us in Christ. He wants us to enjoy those things. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. We're not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Amen. Are you alive, but not really living life? Do you know somewhere deep down that something needs to change in the course of your life? 
does it feel like you have lost your way in life? Yet to others, you seem to know your way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Can you believe that somewhere on the inside of you? Do you believe it? He is the answer to every question. And he loves you just the way you are. Today he's waiting for you with arms open wide. And he wants you just the way you are. Will you make a decision today to surrender your life to him and run into those outstretched arms? If you want to do that, say this prayer out loud, meaning it from the depth of your heart, and you will be saved. Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I believe you are the Son of God, and that you died for me and rose again just to save me. Come into my heart and make me brand new as you have promised. I will live for you all the days of my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Congratulations on taking the most important decision of your life. You are now born again and a brand new person. It has all happened on the inside of you. Now you need to grow in your new faith. And what has happened on the inside will surely be reflected in your everyday life. We can help you grow in your new faith. Please call us at 0700 Fresh Dew or email us at saved at freshdew.tv and we'll be here for you. Thank you for watching Fresh Dew today with Pastor Nkichi Ene. We trust you were blessed by today's episode. For further information on Fresh Dew, please call us on 0700 Fresh Dew, which is 0700 3737-4339. If you're calling from outside Nigeria, the number will be plus 234-700-3737-4339. Our phones are open from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. GMT plus one. You can also send us an email to info at freshdew.tv and we'll be glad to serve you. We also invite you to like, follow, and interact with us on our Twitter and Facebook pages at Fresh Dew TV and also on Pastor Nkechi's Facebook pages at Pastor Ketch. For more information on how you can partner with Fresh Dew and receive Pastor Nkechi's monthly letters and weekly MP3 gifts, please visit our website www.freshdew.tv. Once again, thanks for being with us today and we look forward to seeing you next time on Fresh Dew to receive fresh inspiration and direction for your life.